Well, this is Luann, and I am broadcasting from my husband's pickup truck <laughs> in my son's driveway in Danville, Kentucky. I live way out in the country, and my internet is very spotty, and so hoping to make sure all the waves make it to Ireland, I thought I better come where there is some excellent high-speed internet. Uh, Luan, you're not doing anything to dispel our undoubtedly completely wrong preconceived notions of people <laughs> in Kentucky by, by broadcasting from a pickup. <laughs> I, I know, I know. The stereotypes that we try to avoid making, we just can't help ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> and how about you, Deborah? Um, well, I'm in Northern Virginia near Washington, D.C. And I'm at home with my three children, two dogs, husband, to get <laughs> very, very calming and, and soothing here. Uh, I, I can see somebody uh, tweeting or texting in the group there that they've been down the River Dan. Uh, Luan, <laughs> so I, I presume that must be local. <laughs> so listen, guys, I'm going to let you take over and um, I'll see you on the other side. Okay. Good. Well, thank you for having us. We're really excited to be here. Um, I do want to say that I come from a little bit different perspective. Um, in thinking about strategies in UDL and peers as partners. Majority of my work is with students in primary and secondary education. But I have started working on a post-school outcomes project and preparing students for um, transitioning to higher education. And so when Debbie first approached me about um, putting in a proposal for this, my brain was coming from secondary education, or um, I have to get my Irish terms right, but I believe that's second level. And um, then I realized, oh, this is higher ed. This is a higher ed group. But I believe the strategies that the research and research behind the peer-mediated strategies I'm going to talk about today is primarily done at the secondary level but I can definitely see the benefits at higher ed. And so Debbie with the higher ed perspective is gonna help me make that connection and, and look at how uh, these strategies can be very useful at the higher ed level. Yeah. And, you know, Sean Bracken had been talking about the, or somebody had been talking about that analogy of higher ed as the landscape and, and transitioning to second to, to higher ed is kind of akin to first generation students or being um, foreign in a new land. And definitely that's the case uh, for a lot of the students with whom I've been working most recently at the university level. Um, many of them have been first generation higher ed students in addition to quite a few of them having disabilities of varying kinds. So I, I really love that analogy. Let's see. Okay, my slides aren't wanting to advance either. I know that. Um, if you actually click on the slide itself and then press it, it might work. It often does. Ah, oh, there we go. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, so we did our introduction, sort of. Um, we're going to talk today about things we already know, a lot of what we talked about this morning, just kind of an overview. Um, then look at two specific peer-mediated strategies, talk about what they are, and then think about how might these strategies be utilized at the college level. So first of all, oh, sorry, Debbie. I was just going to say, first of all, what do we know, UDL? And I'm turning it over to Debbie. <laughs> no, I'm jumping all over it. So. Um, we know, and I'm, I'm assuming that there's some basic knowledge here based on the poll we saw that um, everybody kind of has that ex idea of universal design for learning is really about switching your perspective from the barriers are with the student to the barriers are within the environment. So we have to work on building multiple means of engagement, building multiple means of representation, and building multiple means of action and expression in order to help create self-directed expert learners. And certainly at the college level, at the university level, that's what we're looking for. It's, it's much less, we hope, about I have to be here and more about this is what I want to do. And so really building in those pieces, it's a new, at least in the States, it's a relatively new idea. And I think I saw it in somebody's comment too, 
for universities and college professors to think about universal design for learning. There's still a lot of mentality of I get up, I speak. If they don't get it, they don't get it. And um, this idea of UDL is really starting to be addressed at some of the universities, some more than others. Okay, Leanne. You got to unmute. Yeah, I did. Okay. All right. Um, something else that I put down what we know, and it was more of um, something I learned, and I'm hoping um, a lot of you know about. When I was looking at how do I connect what I know to how it might be used at, at higher education level, um, I went on ahead.ie and looked up a lot of resources. I also went to a lot of university um, student support service web pages and, and, and read a lot there. But the universal design license learn resource that is on ahead is an excellent resource for how to think about getting our all of our colleagues with thinking about UDL. And I really liked how it had ideas on how instructors can can uh, utilize UDL and how student support services fit in. And that's a real connection that I see that's so important. Um, also, within this particular document, there's a lot of guidelines. And one of the guidelines is engaging students as UDL partners. So you can see where I got the title for our presentation. The difference that I saw in this document versus um, the way I think about students as UDL partners is here they talk a lot about the instructors using the students as UDL partners, which makes absolute sense. Thinking back to what I just heard from, um, sorry, I have to look, I'm, I'm the worst with remembering um, names and everything, but from Barbara and Lisa on, on inclusive assessments and utilizing the students. So um, in, in looking at and, and analyzing the assessments and how can we make them more varied and scaffold and more accessible to everybody, we need our students involved in that. The way we are looking at peers as UDL partners today is the peers working together as a community of learners, supporting each other to um, be able to access the activities and the instruction within the course. What we also know is that friendships are at the heart of what makes school so enjoyable. I can think about the, the friendships um, that I developed and the relationships that I made in college uh, that's where I met my husband. <laughs> and so friendships and relationships are so important at that level for that support. That's where our supports come from. Um, and we also know that their absence is at the core of what makes school so lonely <clears throat> for too many students with disabilities. And we're certainly seeing that now with the distance learning in the states. Um, most of our schools were not prepared for distance learning, as I'm sure it's the case around the world. And one of the things we're hearing pretty consistently is that the teachers are feeling very isolated and the students are feeling very isolated because they don't have their peers there. Mm -hmm. um, that's been a piece of what I've been working on for another project is, is how you can build in those peer networks and peer supports when you're doing this type of distance learning too. Mm -hmm because it's so important. It's really the heart of everything. Last week, um, Trevor Vaughn talked about social technology, and I just love that term. And he made a comment that social technology is so important and often overlooked. And the social technology, um, the way I understood it, was all about the relationships that are an integral part um, of being successful in college. So, those were the things we know. Now we're going to look at um, what peer-mediated interventions and strategies we're introducing today and how they might work at the college level. So, um, 
the first one, there's two interventions in particular that we're looking at. There's a lot of peer mediated interventions, um, things like peer tutors and peer mentors and peer buddies. We are looking at peer support arrangements, peer networks. And the thing about these two relationships is it works hard to keep all students on the same social role value, valorizations so that we have the same social value. When we have peer tutors um, paired with students, it's always a helper helpy situation and it's always um, you know we're on a different level in these strategies we're all learners working and learning together to support each other understanding that we all learn in different ways that we access information in different ways we express things in different ways and how do we support each other uh, with those variations. So peer support arrangements are what happens in an actual class setting and that's a community of learners um, that kind of sit near each other and support each other throughout the class academically and socially. A peer network on the other hand is more of a social group. It is outside the academic setting and it's a, it tends to be a larger group because this is really about developing those social relationships. Um, and it's, uh, we, we do create them around a student with a disability who needs that additional support to develop those relationships, who needs that additional support to succeed in the class. So just kind of a quick overview of the differences because I know when I first started on our peer support project at the University of Kentucky, I kept confusing peer supports networks. What, what's the difference? So we kind of color and made a little chart on understanding the differences. But um, the biggest one is peer support arrangements occur every time a class is in session. So peers are always supporting each other every time the class meets. So they sit near each other in class as much as possible and support each other throughout. The peer network is more social and occurs um, at minimum on a weekly basis, but hopefully from the peer network expands to coming up with ideas for other social outings and other ways that people can hang out together. So what we've learned through implementation of these two strategies at the um, primary and secondary level is the first thing is peer mediated interventions are flexible support models they're easy and readily implemented and a big one is they're free <laughs> so they don't cost us anything and they aren't really a lot of work maybe a little work up front but a lot of it can occur naturally the class um, we do know that there are significant improvements in social and academic participation in class, um, significant increases in peer relationships, peer affiliations, where peers identify each other as part of their social group, and um, goal attainment of the academic content in class. As a matter of fact, at the secondary level, some of the studies, and, and I didn't state this up front, majority of this work is um, from Dr. Eric Carter from Vanderbilt University. He was a, um, uh, he, he was one of our peer mentors <laughs> in developing our project. And a lot of the research is from Eric Carter. And part of his research has shown that peers who are in peer support arrangements to help support someone with a disability, if they typically make A's and B's, in their courses they continue to do so and that's kind of the the grading system we have in the u.s I, but if they're usually passing at a high level they continue to pass the course at a high level if they tend to make c's which is um, in the middle or d's still passing but just barely or if they are failing and they work in peer support arrangements they typically increase their grades 
by a grade to a grade and a half. So they go from a C to a B or even an A, from failing to a C, from a D. So they, their grades increase as members of these peer support arrangements supporting um, each other. <clears throat> so the first one, primary one we're going to look at is peer support arrangements. And to implement a peer support arrangement, we go through a very systematic process in training our teachers on how to do this. So I thought I would do this systematic process and say, how, how can we look at this in a college course? So of course, you identify a student with a disability who needs assistance at the college level. The student has to request the supports. I understand that part. We don't have to identify classes here. Students are taking a course. They're in it. Identify team members. And think about, are there team members at the college level? Is it just the course instructor? Does the course instructor work any with somebody from student support services? Is it the course instructor and the peers and the students in the class? Who, who are team members to help make something like this work? Um, then we recruit those peers to, to be in a, a peer support arrangement to support each other. Step five is really critical at um, the primary and secondary school level, working with a team of teachers to create a peer support plan. At the college level, I think it's important as a thought process to make sure we're thinking about all the steps we need to go through this. And then the final step is if peers are going to be um, peer supports, we need to orient them to what, what that means. Uh, what do we need to know about each other to be comfortable with each other and to work with each other and to support each other in learning? And hopefully they'll do that not only in class, but maybe through study groups and other things. Let's see. So um, let me go back one. I'm going to jump down to step five. And within step five, we'll talk a little bit about if there's a team who might be part of them. And then we're going to look at what is creating an individualized peer support plan possibly look like at the college level. And then we'll look at step six, orienting peers, because those are kind of the meat of the whole thing. And I am going to turn this next step then over to Debbie. So we looked at this, and, and I've done this at the university level in a couple of different ways. Um, at our university, where I used to be, Trinity Washington University, um, we were not supposed to give accommodations to students unless we got a note from disability services. Other than that, um, it was up to professor discretion whether you wanted to support a student in one way or the other. What I found was that because we had so many students who were first generation college students who were struggling with a lot of things, I work, I work in teacher prep and a lot of my students were actually teaching at the same time. So it was their first year teaching and they were getting their, their degrees to become teachers. And they were working in DC, which or Washington DC, which is one of the most challenging school systems we have um, in, in the US because it, it tends to be a lot of students who are coming from lower socioeconomic status families. There's a lot of homelessness in, in DC. There's a lot of uh, undiagnosed and diagnosed disabilities. There's a cluster here. Um, so I was finding that it would be helpful to think through some of these things for myself before I did presentations. So this was not something I did every time. This was not something I did for every piece, but I tried to internalize these types of questions of during lectures or whole group instruction, what's my typical activity or routine? What do I expect my students to do? And then are there supports or adaptations or, or different means I need to bring in to help all the students access that? During small group instruction or partner work, are there, you know, what are the typical activities and routines? And one of the things that I learned was that it was helpful to start deliberately pairing students together into teams 
and doing some recommendations with, for students. If I saw a student who was really struggling and I knew another group of students had a study group, I would try to pair them together and suggest that maybe it would be good for them to work, work outside of class a little bit on some of these pieces. Um, and then during independent work, again, looking at the typical routines and activities, but also thinking about what is it that I want students to do and how can I help build peer networks to make that happen. So some of the ways that I did that was first of all by, by sitting students near each other. Uh, I did a lot of um, flexible grouping and a lot of moving students around. I encouraged students to talk uh, virtually or some of my students were at the same schools that they were teaching. So talk outside of school about some of the things they saw. I gave them some assignments where they had to observe what they were seeing in their own classrooms and then talk to another teacher about it so that they started to build some peer networks within their own school. So some of these peer networks were specific to our class and some of them were larger peer networks across their field. Um, and for the students who really needed that, that was a helpful way to expand their support status, both in their, in their employment, but also at the university level. Uh, Luann, you can go to the next one, thanks. And I just uh, yeah. wanted to add this, this basically uh, that, that we would fill out at, at the, um, with the classroom teachers and instructors in primary and secondary ed. So when I showed it to Debbie, she's like, yeah, we don't do that at the college <laughs> level. Um, but we did talk about how those columns, you know, the lecture, the small group instruction, the assessments, which we just learned so much about, falls right here. What is my typical assessment? What are my expectations for students? What are, and here we have support and adaptations, but the UDL strategies, what do I need to do? to these. So taking each piece, Debbie did say that's, that's a perfect way to use this as a way to think about how you design your instruction. And so the next form, let me move there. Here we go. This form is really much more student driven. Um, and this is one that could be done either by the student with disability services or by the student with their personal network support or the student and the professor, if they have a professor who's willing to do this. Um, we, the way this form looks is on the left, it's at the beginning of class, during lectures or whole group instruction, during small group or instruction or partner work, uh, during independent work, other things, and at the end of the class. And then the three columns are the focus student can, dot, 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 the peer partners can, and the facilitator can. And the way this works is, we would have the student start to think about what is it that I'm doing really well here and where am I struggling? And then what supports might be needed? So this is a place where um, I had some students who were very clear that taking notes in class was very difficult, if not impossible to do, while also paying attention to what we were talking about and thinking about it. So for those students, the student would walk through this and say, okay, well, during lectures or whole group instruction, I can't be taking notes. So they would pair up with another student and we would work on building some of those peer supports within the class. Sometimes those were facilitated by the disabilities support services. Um, and sometimes that was facilitated more through kind of natural connections within the classroom that I helped facilitate. And sometimes the student facilitated them on their own, which really was ideal because having that expert learner process is, is what we're aiming for. We want the students to be able to advocate for themselves. We want them to use those self-determination skills because we know how important they are across employment, across their lives, um, and outside of school. Um, so anyway, one of the other things that we would do to facilitate this is there were times we'd sit down with the disability service providers and we'd talk about as a group what are we seeing with certain patterns in our school in our university right one of the things because it was such a small university because it was such a small 
um, population that really catered to a lot of students who came from the Washington DC area. So had gone through schools that were not necessarily preparing them for university level work. Um, how could we help build some of that into the needs and how could we provide professional development for the other university professors, the other pe pe instructors to make sure that they were thinking through some of these things too. So one of the things that our university did was to create a professional development series on universal design for learning. And in that series, we talked through these kinds of planning questions. So during lectures and whole group instruction, what might be some of the barriers for that student? What, what should they be focusing on? And what might they have to leave to the side? And where can we add support so that they can still get that other information? Um, during small group and instruction work, are there things we need to think about? Are there ways to gather information that is not just through writing? Um, we started to explore ways for students to take notes through iPads using um, putting our PowerPoints up on our learning system. Uh, L what are those called? Learning management system. Learning management system. Thank you. Um, Blackboard or Canvas or whatever. Um, and then we started thinking about how can we build in peer networks to do this. So we would create discussion boards where we had certain students paired together. Uh, <laughs> we would, um, so LMS is BLE. Is that the name for it? In, in, in Virtual our... learning environment, maybe? I'm guessing. <laughs> All right. Too many acronyms in our lives. <laughs> Good job, Luann. You got it right. Um, and now I totally forgot where I was. So Luann, I'll let you give an example at the secondary level while I think through again what I was saying. <laughs> Sorry, got distracted. Um, <laughs> um, chat boxes are fun, but they. they <laughs> um, but anyway, I I just think I'm I'm going to actually move on to the next slide, and we'll take it from there because I think that will help considerably. So um, this was a quote I took. I've I've started really listening to a lot of podcasts. My daughter turned me on to listening to podcasts during my drives to and from work and um, while I'm doing dishes. And Erin Sheldon is from Canada. She is a parent and she also um, is a disability expert. And so this is a quote from her I heard in one of the podcasts. One of the most powerful ways you can support a student with a disability is to ask them what is important to them. <laughs> and that goes back to um, the step about a team. And do we have a team when we're planning our courses and our instruction and we're thinking about UDL? Um, is it something that a course instructor is doing all on their own or is there a team? Um, thinking about UDL as a, as a student with disability who needs supports, who has to request the supports, who has to say what kind of supports they need, they need to be part of a team. But not alone because sometimes, um, you know, we need our peers to help support us, to help us um, advocate for what we need. And also, we need to also help our peers and help them to advocate for themselves. So it's, it's always a two-way street. Um, and that's where those, those forms really come into play for that thought process. Again, at the um, high school and primary level, we fill those forms out for, you know, during science class. What will the peer do? What will, because <laughs> um, when they first come into class, some teachers make kids have assignments so they sit down, they're quiet, they get busy on their assignment. Other teachers let kids chit chat and talk. So, you know, we really think about those different environments and, and what, um, how, how, what supports different people will need coming in and how as students and peers, we can support each other. We don't always have to have it be the adult facilitator of the room, the course, the class, whatever. So Luann, I'm gonna jump on that just to kind of tie these things together with the assessment piece that, that we were just, that our colleagues were discussing earlier. 
Um, one of the questions in the Q&A box is, do you have any tips for encouraging students to engage with grading criteria and rubrics? Um, one of the things that I would do in my courses was I would have the students, I would put up the competencies that I wanted them to learn in each assignment. And then I would have them think about how would you go about demonstrating this knowledge. And from there, I would have them break into small groups of other people who had similar ways of demonstrating that, that competency. And they would think through what they felt would be a good metric to, to, for me to use to measure their competencies. Across that, I would then take all of those from the class and we'd look at them together and see where they overlapped and where they didn't and talk about which ones were the most important for measuring that particular competency. And that type of student engagement with that assessment process helped to A, help students find other people who worked like they did and who had styles similar to them in terms of learning, but it also helped to really get them engaged in what is it that I, as an expert learner, want to learn and do? And one of the um, ideas I had jotted down in my notes from listening to um, speakers last week and the week before as well, was thinking back to the course syllabus. So at the start of the course, I can remember as a college student getting my course syllabus that basically outlined what this course was about, what my expectations were, what the assignments I had to turn in throughout the year, articles I might have to read, um, assessments, all of that is outlined in the syllabus. So taking that syllabus, so as a course instructor, I've designed it. Maybe my first day of the course is going over that syllabus and having the students help me think through how to ensure I've included as much of the universal design for learning and for instruction and for assessment within my syllabus and within my expectations. And that they can then help me think through and maybe add some additional ideas I hadn't thought about. Next slide. All right, thank you. Unless there are any questions or anything anybody wants to jump in with. I know, I know we're just, we're running a little bit out of time, but I just wanted to, before we leave our session, and then it's just to ask you guys, have you learned anything, you know, in this process of looking at peer media and um, stuff with students, have you guys learned anything about your own professional practice and how you uh, interact with your own peers? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Go ahead, you can go first, Luann. Well, I was gonna say, I think the biggest piece that, and I'm still really working on it, and I tried especially hard with, with this particular presentation, are the PowerPoints and the online presentations and how much, what do you put in a slide? What's relevant? Um, you know, we used to love to put in all kinds of pictures and, and the initial slide design I had was crazy background stuff. So taking out all that visual clutter. You'll notice I have a black background with white writing. We work in one of my projects with a vision um, expert and his recommendation has been the black background with the white writing. Well, we want the contrast, we know that, but he, he specifically recommended the black background. And so when we do our presentations our, to whole groups, we kind of do a contrast of here's here's the slide with the black background here it is with the white which do you prefer and we get hands down the black background as as a preference so things like that um, I'm really working on I've done a lot of work on um, now I just forgot the, the name of it but when you put up a picture and I had one picture that I had in my notes to describe the picture and I didn't do it so those are the things I'm still really working on and for me, I, I realized how, um, how some interdisciplinary connections could be made across my university. So because of some of the work I did with Universal Design for Learning, I started working with a couple of uh, scientists. Um, one was a biologist, one was a chemist, and um, one was 
one was in charge of our nurse practitioner program. And what we found was that we were having similar issues around student engagement. And so coming together with them to map out some things we had tried and some things we thought about and some things that we hadn't thought about. Some of them worked across disciplines, some of them didn't, you know, but it was nice to have somebody else to be able to bounce ideas off of. And it was also great because then I could use their interdisciplinary expertise for some of the things I was teaching in my classrooms, right? So when I was teaching how to teach science using universal design for learning, I could actually bring in scientists from our own university and have them be guest lecturers, so. Love it. It's, it's always nice to understand that who knew students are actually the same as teachers. They're the same species. <laughs> they need the same things. <laughs> Listen, uh, thanks so much. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was really, really insightful, really interesting. I think it's given us and me a lot of thought for our own work. We use a peer triad system in our UDL badge, which is a peer support system as well. So uh, it's definitely given me some ideas on how we might look to improve that system. So thank, thanks to both of you, and thanks to all of our contributors today.